Perfect. All right. Well, to kick everything off today, I will do a brief introduction. My name is Mindy Miranda, and I'm a senior community manager uh, for Aperion. And with us today, we also have Eric Robinson, um, who is also a senior community manager. And today we're going to be going over some budgeting basics uh, for boards. So today's agenda is kind of a, an overview um, not anything crazy in depth, but we're gonna be going over some things like what is a budget, uh, the schedule of how budgets typically work, uh, an overview of what is included in those budgets, and then we'll open it up at the end for some questions and answers. So to kick things off today, um, we're just gonna kind of go over what budgets are. So. PowerPoint slide here uh, explains that the association's budget is the, uh, the management company and the board's responsibility to ensure that a community, community pardon me, allocates the HOA assessments in a manner uh, that maintains or increases the financial and physical health of the community. So looking at that, um, kind of taking a step back of what is a budget and how they're split up. So um, typically, you're going to see two different budgets, an operating budget and a reserve budget. An operating budget, um, <clears throat> the purpose of that is to cover the usual monthly expenses that HOAs incur. Um, this includes items like insurance premium, routine maintenance, management fees, uh, and dues and expenses are factors that an association's uh, operating budget includes. Uh, so typically your operating budget should be managed from a checking account. This makes it easy to make deposits and withdrawals um, on a regular basis as this operating fund typically is what you're going to use to pay your vendors. And then taking a look at reserve budgets, uh, in contrast, an association's reserve fund covers a period of anywhere from maybe five to 30 years. It's allocated to cover the cost of major replacements and repairs down the line. So examples of co those costs would include like street re repaving or roof replacements. Um, and folks ask, you know, typically how much should I keep in, you know, we keep in our reserves. It just depends, honestly. Um, having a reserve study conducted will let you know how much your reserve fund should contain for the projects that you have upcoming. Um, and typically because reserve budgets aren't used on a regular basis, they're usually kept in like a savings or an interest bearing account. So here on the screen here, uh, we've got an example of what a typical budget would look like. So um, as you can see, it's split out by different accounts, uh, income accounts, maintenance accounts, um, general admin accounts, and then split up between um, different tabs there regarding reserves, uh, operating, you may see something for Arbor services or for your irrigation, um, you may see insurance premiums, those different things. And those are typically allocated month to month. Um, and in some case, like the operating expenses here um, through quarterly, depending on when you pay your assessments. Um, and then basically it gives the totals of all of those things and kind of a, a, an overview of what those look like from month to month. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, this is Eric. I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to talk about one of the most difficult parts um, of, of drafting your budget, uh, in my opinion, is sticking to this kind of timeline. So. This timeline is indicative of a January through December fiscal year, uh, which typically uh, all our associations are usually a January through December fiscal year for, for reasons. Uh, some may have uh, different fiscal years based on um, you know, when they might incur different expenses or, or how their association was originally developed uh, and planned out in terms of that. But, for today's training, we're gonna talk about a January through December fiscal year. So when I say that this annual schedule for budget planning is difficult, it's because it starts in August. Uh, and for anyone who lives in Central Oregon all the time, uh, or even if you're just here in the summer, you know, you know that the summer uh, population increases 
Uh, it's when all the pools are open. It's when all the landscaping is taking place. Uh, and it's when a lot of people are doing painting, uh, communities are doing asphalt projects, uh, or different architectural uh, improvements to their homes oftentimes take place during the summertime. So as a board and as a management company starting in August, which is probably the busiest time of the entire year because of all those things happening, we actually have to start thinking about beginning the process and drafting the budget for the next fiscal year. So part of the part of the manager and part of the board is always in the day to day and and you know handling all of those things that I just described. But then part of our responsibility and the board's responsibility is also looking forward to um, what next year is going to contain. And the budget can take a little bit of time to put together because uh, you are somewhat dependent uh, for some numbers on other people. So uh, starting around August 1st, uh, the, the manager you know, is typically gonna talk to the board uh, and they're gonna discuss if there's any uh, RFPs or requests for proposals that the board wants to put out for any of their annual service providers. Uh, and we're also gonna take a look at the status of the current reserve study with the association. So, you know, landscaping pools, snow removal, those are kind of the big uh, three annual contractors that, that a lot of associations have. So if you're, if the board, you know, wants to seek a better price, if they have a competitive bidding policy that requires them to put their contracts out to bid every so often, or, or if they're dissatisfied with their services in any of those areas, then uh, management would put together an RFP uh, and put those out to bid so that the, we can get numbers back. Uh, the board can make a decision on what they want to do with those vendors moving forward. And then you have numbers to plug in for when you're actually drafting your budget. So, you know, first part of August is kind of when that is occurring. And then about mid August, we're looking at soliciting new contract term rates from the existing business partners in the association. So, Kind of depending on what's going on with competitive bidding and putting contracts out to bid. Uh, let's say hypothetically you're happy with your landscape, you're happy with your pool contractor, uh, then management or the board is going to go to those annual business partners and start having a conversation about what their projection is going to be for their terms uh, in the next year, uh, in this case 2023. This can be difficult for those service providers to, to give you. I mean, just like us, just like the board, uh, they're typically in the busiest part of their season around this time. And they may not know exactly what next year is going to look like for them based on you know some of these employees are seasonal. Uh, what's going on with the economy and inflation? Do they have to raise uh, their wages in order to uh, attract uh, those people to, to perform the work next year. So it's not often easy for them, but we do need to start that conversation early because from September all the way through, you know, before Thanksgiving, uh, all of our regular fiscal year, January through December clients are having their budget meetings and passing those budgets. So we're opening the conversation in August. Uh, it might take a little bit of time talking to those service providers but you wanna get as accurate a picture as you can about what's going on with those projected rates. Moving on to uh, September 1st, that's when we're gonna begin drafting the actual budget. Uh, hopefully your budget meeting is set. Typically those do take place in September, October, early November. And we'll talk about the reason for that in a little bit. Uh, but that's basically, we're gonna, we're gonna bring up uh, the budget and we're gonna start plugging in the numbers that we know. Uh, we'll talk in a slide or two about where those numbers come from and how they're developed, uh, but this is just the general timeline here. So moving on to September, October, and November, that's when the draft budget is being finalized. Uh, in some associations, some of our boards, they like to be really involved. Um, they might just assign the treasurer to work with us on the first draft of the budget, or they may just put it in the manager's hands to draft that first budget provide it to the board, and then they give some feedback and revise until everyone's happy with, you know, essentially a final product. That's also the time we're going to hold all of those budget meetings, and the board's going to approve their budget for the next fiscal year. 
Moving on, uh, depending on when your budget meeting is, once that is approved, we're in the post budget period. So uh, 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 generally a budget letter is drafted. It has a um, summary of the budget. It includes what the options for payment are and uh, very clearly says what's going on with the assessments, whether they're staying the same or they're going up 3% or, or whatever ended up happening with the approval of that budget. So that's going to be emailed uh, and mail, hard mailed to uh, all the owners. Now, the reason that this timeline you know, exists in this manner is because of this right here. For Oregon law, budgets must be received by owners within 30 days of the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so that means if uh, I'm an owner in an association that has a regular fiscal year, by law, I need to have notice of what that next year's budget is and what my assessment's going to be 30 days before it goes into effect. So December 1st is uh, the deadline for that. Uh, it's always a good idea as well in the budget letter, uh, any mailings to include reminders of the payment schedule, uh, whether it's monthly, quarterly, you know, semi-annually, uh, annually, and how they can pay those assessments. Moving on, uh, then you hit January 1st and you're in your new fiscal year. So Eric, you're, this is Dave. Uh, you're saying December, it's gotta be out by December 30th. Is that, if I'm backing into it, is that correct? It, it has to be received by the owners by December 1st because it has to be 30 days before the end of the fiscal year. Okay, uh, and, and that's the reason why, um, you know, we're starting those budget meetings, meetings in September. They're going all the way through October and into early November. Um, but generally, you know, our, our goal for, for our clients is always to have uh, all of the budgets approved, all of the budget letters drafted and uh, emailed and hard mailed before the Thanksgiving holiday. So usually the week before is when we're, you know, getting all those last minute ones out. Um, yeah, the, well, this is really helpful, but, uh, and, and having this context, cause our, our budget meeting is not till November 15th. Yeah, so- And that was kind of set. So that, that makes it kind of tight. Yeah, it, it'll be a little tight, but, but it's doable. If you approve a budget okay. November 15th, um, you right. know, your, your manager could easily have um a budget letter ready already uh sure. with, with that owner budget prepared with that assessment uh the post budget you know emailing and hard mailing does not take long so sure as long as everyone's ready to go in on that on that um meeting on november 15th and and approve that budget uh that's timeline that could be met but that's about as late as we'd like to have them um i'm not sure um you know, I, I guess on our end, um, I'm guessing most everyone on the line today is, uh, you know, a client of, of a period. Uh, we have, you know, 60-ish clients, um, which means we're having, you know, and, and only a few of those are not regular fiscal years. So we're having, you know, around 50 to 55 budget meetings in a period of about eight weeks, eight or 10 weeks. So we do have to spread them out a bit. Uh, just so that we can make sure to hit all of our deadlines and, and that all the work is being thoroughly vetted uh, and 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 accurate. No, I appreciate the clarity. Of course, and it's and, my my first. Uh, what am I like? Month three is the treasurer, and <laughs> I, and I've kind of been asking like, hey, need to talk about the budget process. So this is uh, invaluable. So yeah, it, I appreciate it, Eric fortuitously timed um yeah so we're gonna do i'm gonna dig in with everybody here and and please just like dave just did if you have a question go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask um so i don't feel like i'm talking in an echo chamber here but the meat and potatoes of drafting the budget i'm gonna go over a few things here so the drafting process is kind of a mixture of things it's a mixture of historical data uh, so expenses for uh, those different light items that you saw maybe, you know, in, in your existing budget, in previous budgets, what is typically getting spent per year in all of those areas? Are, are you habitually overspending in one expense account, but underspending in another? 
you know, balancing those numbers through uh, the actual expenses that were incurred uh, for this year and for several previous years uh, is part of where some of those numbers are gonna come from. Uh, as I talked about in the timeline, the contract term projections for the, the business partners in your association is another piece of that puzzle. So, um, you know, as I said, pool, landscape, those kinds of those kinds of folks. Um, and in today's environment, uh, I think we're generally bracing and expecting, you know, double digit percentage increases uh, simply for our the business partners to be able to pay their employees enough to live and work in Central Oregon currently. Um, the other piece of this, which is also somewhat frustrating and difficult to track down, but but we do our best is any known increases to utility rates. So um, we generally call every service utility provider for every one of our clients. Um, thankfully in Central Oregon, there's not too many uh, different ones, but we uh, have a conversation with them about any increases that they have planned or if they're expecting anything. Uh, it can be a little difficult because some utilities are, you know, they're public utilities, uh, they have to go to votes uh, of their members to do rate increases. Uh, sometimes you just don't know. So using historical data and, and a general, you know, maybe inflationary number of five or 8% or something like that in lieu of actual hard knowledge of what might happen to those utility service provider rates uh, is generally what we're gonna do. And then the last piece of that is really the board's goals. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few slides, but uh, certainly that's something that should be discussed as the budget's being drafted. Is it a year where, you know, you want to keep assessments as low as possible, uh, in which case you are, you know, doing everything you can to keep the cost down? Or is it a year where you're like, you know, we've been, we've been low the last couple of years, uh, but we've overspent in a few areas. We feel like we need a bigger jump. jump. And we're going to add some contingency to the budget uh, in case we overspend again. And, and so those are the kinds of things that go into actually drafting those numbers. Now, the goal there is for net zero. So, you know, I, I, I've been doing this for about eight, eight and a half years now. Uh, and certainly every board's goal is to make their living in their community affordable uh, with the level of assessments that are being levied against the owners. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great goal um, and we want to help achieve that as the management company. The board wants to achieve that for its owners, for resale values, for, for all of those things. But when we're drafting our budgets, the goal is that whatever that assessment is, it's going to meet the projected expenses for the next year. So we just deal in reality here when we're drafting the budget. If your management company and your pool vendor and your landscape maintenance contractor all are saying we need 12% increases to our rates to be able to continue the same level of service that you've been having and to hire the people that we need to do that work, then it's very likely keeping assessments flat is not gonna be an option. Um, so if, I'm going to go back real quick to the budget slide. So in this example budget, um, you can see the assessments right here uh, meet the total projected expenses right here, giving us a net zero for this budget. So uh, we can talk, we'll talk a little in a little bit about some things that a board might be able to do to keep the assessments a little bit lower um, and assuage some of the potential increases that may occur. But it is the board's fiduciary duty to assess at the level that's required to maintain and operate the amenities and, and uh, fulfill the maintenance responsibilities that are laid out in the governing documents. Eric, are you, this is Dave again, sorry. Um, have you got some guidance in terms of, you know, I'm looking at our last 
like the financials this month, electricity and water, are you gotten some guidance from the local utility groups on what they expect is going to happen next year? Is that some information you already have? Yeah, Dave, we do. Uh, our, okay. customer, our customer service gal has called every utility company we have in Central Oregon and got yep. all of that information. So we are working off of the latest uh, on those. So moving to uh, 12 month budget expenses versus monthly projections. So uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but going back here, uh, you can see that this spreadsheet is January through December and we have expenses for every month, but they're different. So, you know, the landscape contract doesn't kick in until March here in this example uh, and ends in November. So there's no expenses for landscaping in January, February, or December. Uh, there's a number of other things, you know, repairs and maintenance to the landscape, thatch and aeration. Um, but then there's one, oops, then there's ones like management that are the same across all of uh, that budget. So when I say 12 month budget versus monthly projections, uh, all we're saying is that at, at a period, we are trained and we train our staff to do a 12 month budget, meaning we are projecting the expenses in the budget to occur when we believe they're actually going to occur. So what I mean by that is, you know, take a landscape contract, for example. If a landscape contract starts in March and ends in November, uh, instead of taking that total annual amount and dividing it by 12, which, uh, uh, and dividing it by 12 to get a number to put in for every month, you are projecting it for the month in which you think that expense is gonna be incurred. So the reason that we do that is because if you're looking at your financials, like I think Dave might have some open, um, and you're tracking variances and how your budget is doing year to date versus what you've actually budgeted for, if you have an annual amount for all of these different light items and you just divide it by 12 and you put the same amount in every month, it's gonna be really hard to get a really accurate projection of what's actually happening and how close you are to budget because you know for January and December, you're gonna have a $2,000 negative variance for your landscape contract, even though it hasn't even started yet. And that's of course gonna take um, your total operating expenses variances and your net income variances and, and kind of muck them up. Um, so that's just the reason that we, we build the budgets the way we do, which again is to oops, to try and project when that expense is actually going to be incurred. Yeah, Eric, for some reason, um, and I, I'm, I'll speak to our community manager about it, like that's not, I'll give you a perfect example, snow removal, they spread the expense over the whole year. Well, that makes no sense. I mean, they spread the budget throughout the whole year. And so it looks wonky now. Um, again, I wasn't around for that budget process, but my expectation would be exactly what you're saying. It should be realistic with seasonality of landscaping, snow sure. removal, those kind of things. Yeah, I agree with that, Dave. And I don't today. I don't <laughs> want to get into your specific community. Uh, or, oh yeah, or yeah, manager, yeah. But um, absolutely. I I don't know if there was a reason for that or not, but generally that is how we're doing it. Yeah, no, that's great. No, and I it, really we have a new manager this year, so. I'll, I'll definitely catch up with her on the whole concept. It's, I appreciate it. Sure. So uh, moving on, the, the next piece of this puzzle, uh, as many talked about earlier, is going to be reserve contributions. So I, I'd like to clarify one thing before I move on. The reserve contribution amount in your budget is not, is not a reserve budget. So what I mean by that is you're figuring out how much you're gonna fund in your reserve fund for a fiscal year by looking at your reserve funding model and figuring out what that you know mathematical algorithm is telling, telling you you need to save in order to replace that roof in 15 years or whatever it is. We don't do reserve budgets, which means that your budget, um, you know, I, I guess I, I'm speaking to how a period does it, but um, we don't budget for, you know, this 
reserve project, this reserve project, and this reserve project are all going to be done this year. And here's our budget for that. And then you track it like a normal operating account. So there's going to be, you know, projected expenses in certain months and there's going to be variances and all that. Because the reserve study that you have with your association says, you know, generally in, in a fiscal year, what is going to come up for repair or replacement. And that's that doesn't always happen. You know, it, if you're supposed to replace your roof next year and we're drafting your budget, but the roof guy says, oh, you got five more years on this thing. Um, that's not something that's, you know, going to happen for, for a few more years. So um, the number for your budget is based on the funding model for your reserve study. But it, I, I don't call it, we don't call it a reserve budget. It's it's contributions to your reserve so that when those things do come up, whether it's next year or the following year or 10 years down the road, that money is has been getting saved for that whole time and is ready to go to meet that expense. Uh, the final piece of that is the understanding of your assessment calculations. So um, read your governing documents. They may have some really funky stuff in there, particularly if you're part of a townhome or a condominium association, uh, about how those assessments are, are done. Uh, they may not be equally spread. Uh, they may be based on square footage. They may be based on, you know, if there, we have associations that some owners have an alley behind them, but not all of them do. So those owners have different assessments because they pay for the maintenance uh, and reserve funding for anything going on with the alley. So it's not always, you know, here's our number divided by the number of owners in the community and that's everyone's assessment. Uh, make sure that you or your manager are have a really good understanding of what's in your governing documents and how those assessments are calculated. Uh, this is just highlighting one of the things that we've already talked about. Review the last five years of your budgets. What are those trends? You know, what hasn't been addressed? Uh, is there something that accidentally didn't get budgeted for? I'll say I, I accidentally didn't budget for a several thousand dollar expense for one of my clients this year. And so, you know, live and learn. Um, it was it, the board didn't catch it. It was a, it was just a mistake um, that no one caught. But uh, certainly looking back on your historical data um, is, is and the trends of what's going on with those expense line item accounts is important when you're drafting your budget. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this. So I'm going to hand it over to Mindy for a few slides. Uh, this is uh, reserve funding. So there's several different strategies and models for reserve funding. I just took a snip of a um, current assessment contribution reserve funding model from one of our clients, uh, which showed a beginning balance here. And so you can see this was probably done, um, this is an older one, it was done in 2018, so it's starting in fiscal year 2019. So what this funding model is showing here is the annual contribution for 2019, as we just discussed, for this association would be 127,974. Now, as the years progress, you know, this number increases based on, um, you know, the mathematical algorithm that the reserve study specialists use for inflation and for useful lives and for, you know, product changes uh, and, and all that. Uh, so that's going up every year. Again, this is a reason why it's really hard to keep assessments totally flat in an association for any amount of time, because every year things go up. That's just what they do. Uh, this is the annual interest that's being projected to be earned on the balance that sits in the account for that time. This column here is a summary of what the annual expenditures are projected to be. So, you know, 2019, we're going to contribute this. We already had this, but we're going to spend this if all of the um, things in the reserve study actually do need to occur, which I'll say is pretty rare, where you're nailing it right on the dot with every single component in an association. 
So after the contributions in 2019, with that beginning balance and that spending, this is where that account would end up. Uh, this is, I think, a topic for another day, fully funded reserves and percent funded. Um, but that's a different way of looking at the reserve account. It's a different funding model, uh, which is obviously a, a very high level of reserve contribution funding. But that's generally kind of how we're reading this. And this is also the reason why it's recommended that um, every year or you know, at a minimum every several years, an association is getting the reserve study updated. So those things that you didn't do, you wanna update those in the model and project out to where you think they're actually gonna occur now. Uh, if you did some projects and they came in over budget or under budget, you give that information to the reserve study specialists and then they can adjust their figures uh, and then reset those timelines for whatever those elements are that you performed. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> All right, thanks, Eric. Um, so let's talk a little about uh, maintenance. Uh, so maintenance is going to occur, obviously, every year and is not something that you want to postpone or to kind of put off for another day. So uh, in order to attain top market values for your association and ensuring that residents' quality of life um, is a good one. It requires that communities be well maintained and aesthetically pleasing, which I'm sure you can all attest to. So um, things break, things stop working, and things need replaced from time to time. So um, fixing those emergencies and solving maintenance problems is almost always going to be more expensive than preventing them in the first place. Um, so it's important to uh, create a proper maintenance plan and proactively fix and replace things before they break um, and cause major problems um, and can actually end up saving you money in the long run uh, to do it this way instead of waiting. So it's definitely better to be proactive than reactive on those maintenance things. Um, more repairs and uh, replacements if they're ignored. Um, obviously the community is going to be less happy and can cause bigger problems, can cause safety hazards. Um, and decrease property values. Um, so it's important that they're handled properly and on time. So um, one thing to kind of keep in the back of your head is all maintenance issues can never all be taken care of all at once. Uh, so it's important to work um, with your community manager and within boards to kind of create a prioritization list of like what's emergency, what is high priority, what is low priority, um, because maintenance is crucial, but but trying to best vet how what your priorities are going to be is important to that work. So um, you'll definitely want to allocate some funding just for regular housekeeping and maintenance, you know, in in your community. So um, those are all important things to kind of keep an eye out for when it uh, when it comes to our maintenance. Uh, so this slide is kind of talking a little bit about, um, you know, when the budget allows, maybe there's a possibility for your association to find projects that have a long-term positive return on their investment. Uh, we're talking about things like water reduction, uh, it may be in your landscaping, um, if there's an opportunity, you know, with your association to approve some parameters if people want to move to zero scaping. Uh, I know that's becoming pretty popular uh, with some of our clients, uh, or maybe the board feels like that patch of lawn that nobody uses would be better, you know, serviced by, um, you know, kind of being renovated to, to eat up less water and less maintenance time with the landscapers and less mowing time and all those pieces. Uh, it could also be solar. So, uh, you know, solar lighting uh, in, in areas of the community can replace, um, you know, incandescent bulbs or maybe LED or something like that. The Energy Trust of Oregon has programs and rebates uh, for, you know, depending on your community uh, and what components you have. Uh, some of these things could certainly be discussed during uh, budgeting time. Now, 
budgets for associations are generally set up to maintain everything, re maintain, repair, and replace everything that was originally developed with the association. So, you know, your reserve funding is funding the replacement of, you know, plant material or, or lawn or an irrigation system down the road. But if you change to zero scaping and, and minimal water and less maintenance, you know, those are all adjustments that need to be made in that reserve study at an update uh, and with your with your budget. And then the board's going to have to figure out where that money to do that project is going to come from. And a funny cartoon. <laughs> this is not a reserve funding plan that we uh, recommend here. Mindy, is this one you? Is this one you or me? Sorry, everyone. It's our first time doing this. <laughs> I can I can certainly do this. Okay. So um that was not the most glamorous part of being on an HOA board. Um you shouldn't hesitate to raise assessments to set your community up on a permanent path of uh physical and fiscal integrity. So uh feeling to raise assessments to cover your actual expenses is a breach of fiduciary duty, as Eric was saying um, on the board's part. And it's also a breach of the agreement with the owners to expect the boards to protect their assets. Uh, nobody wants to be the bad guy and approve you know, an increase to something, but these are necessary steps that need to be taken in order to maintain the community um, in which way that everybody wants. Um, so by increasing assessments, you know, a smaller amount every year rather than a larger amount, you know, once every three or four years um, helps to, you know, to spread those out over time throughout the ownership. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but special assessments uh, should always be a last resort for a funding option. And it's certainly, if can be, uh, not a substitute for budgetary shortfalls. Awesome, Mindy. I want to add one more thing to that and just to pile on what you already said. Uh, raising assessments a little bit every year to keep up with the increases in your service vendors and inflation is going to be a lot easier to digest for your owners and your association than if you keep dues you know, flat for four years and then on the fifth year, you know, the board decides, boy, we, we, we've really you know, kind of, kind of have way more expenses now and we can't float it anymore. We need to increase 25% or something like that. Like that's a lot harder pill to swallow for the owners than 4%, you know, over the previous four or five years. And, and certainly I can say that through experience. <laughs> and here's a graphic illustration. Uh, <laughs> What keeping assessments uh, flat in a um, in a community with a lot of maintenance and um, high expectations might look like. Mindy? There we go. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted there. All right, so let's talk about wish lists. It's okay to want things in your community. Um, I think it would be silly to think that there, you know, that this wasn't something. So, but as the site says, part of a good budget is making that wish list, and you can use smart budgeting techniques um, to actually, you know, actualize some of those wish wishes without jeopardizing the financial well-being. Um, so you can take a look at this, you know, kind of a short-term wish list and a long-term wish list, um, and determine the level of services that, you know, that you want to have planned and request the justification and estimate for, for these and getting this new work done, um, and, and helping to make the community a better place. Um, so with that, you'll want to work with the association's budget or finance committee, if there is one. 
um, to review and see if there are income or expense, you know, account items line by line and kind of base these services um, on experience or, or what it's expected to be. So um, doing this is gonna help to evaluate areas to potentially reduce spending um, and then, but not jeopardize the community's overall objectives of where they want to see themselves in the future. So um, prioritizing any new capital improvement projects um, the board has already approved or including a new expense request and these wish list items um, should be added into your budget so you can keep an eye on you know what things may look like in the future and potential add-ons to the community that you can do. I like that one. <laughs> uh, I, I'll talk about this one, Mindy. So expect okay. expect the unexpected. So as Mindy was saying, special assessments should be a last resort. Um, a good budget will have a rollover stash of funds for emergencies. And this can come in several ways. This can come via retained earnings which is, uh, you might see on your balance sheet, but this is rolling positive income over expenses year by year for pretty much the life of the association uh, or budgeting a contingency. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about retained, the retained earnings first. So uh, every year uh, it's highly recommended. I know that we, you know, we at Aperion always do this at every annual meeting, but every annual meeting of an association uh, we ask the owners to pass an IRS 70-604 tax resolution. And what that resolution does is the owners approve it at the annual meeting, and it allows the association to uh, roll over any unused uh, operational assessments that they collected for that year but weren't spent in the, in the budget into the next year. So if they didn't pass that, that income could be subject to taxation, uh, to refund to the owners. Um, and it, it's just a really good idea to roll that positive income over uh, into retained earnings so that it acts as a cash cushion for overspending. Uh, you know, as, as good as you or, or we may be at projecting expenses, we're never gonna be a real write on. Um, sometimes it'll be in and sometimes it'll be, it'll be too much. Um, or you can budget a contingency. You know, we do have some clients that do this. We just want to have a contingency line item. Uh, we want it to be X amount and that's going to, you know, help the bottom line when we overspend in some areas. Uh, or as Mindy was saying, if you've got a capital improvement project that you want to do, uh, good planning for that, you can build saving for that in your budget um you know you don't have to call it contingency it could be you know whatever it is a new pond or playground structure or whatever it is uh but again a, a new capital improvement isn't going to come from your from your reserve your reserve is being saved to replace everything that already exists a capital improvement which is li very likely going to be discussed how to do in your association's governing documents is something that has to come via another source of revenue. So uh, maybe you do want to assess your owners because everybody really wants this thing and they're willing to pay some money to do it. Uh, or maybe you want to save for it over a year or two in your operating budget. Hey, Eric. Yeah, we are actually the, the official portion has ended here. So um, go ahead. And if you want to take your put on your video or unmute and, and ask some questions, Mindy and I are happy to help if we can. Uh, so this is Mary Lynn. And what was that IRS form you just mentioned? It's the IRS 70-604 tax resolution. Okay, tax revolution. Re res 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 resolution. Right, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> All right, thank you. And uh, yeah, it basically it basically just says uh, anything that's earned from assessments 
uh, in the course of the year that isn't spent for what it was collected for can be rolled over and becomes exempt from taxation and then can be on your balance sheet as retained earnings and can go toward um, you know, a number of different things. Uh, one thing I did want to say, if I could, is um, you know, when we give our spiel about the 70-604 in our annual meetings with our clients, we say that it can be used to potentially assuage any increases to the assessments for the following year. So if you have a really good year where you underspend and the association has a bunch of extra operating cash, you can carry that forward in your budget for the following fiscal year to help keep those assessments down. There's there's kind of two ways that I know of of doing that. Um, let's say it's five thousand dollars. Let's say there was five thousand dollars of savings for for your association this past year, and you'd like to carry that forward into the next year to keep assessments as low as you can. So you would build that into your budget either as a source of carry forward revenue. So it would be in your income accounts, um, in which case, you know, the actual assessment calculation that you're collecting from your owners could be $5,000 less than what your total projected expenses are gonna be. Or you could put it in your budget as a, um, a negative expense item. So that therefore that would lower your total projected expense bottom line, and then subsequently lower the assessment calculation. Hopefully that made some sense. Are there other questions, comments from anybody? Um, are you going to send the slides to us that you that you just showed all the different? I took notes, but. <laughs> Uh, I think we probably can. Um, I'll talk to our uh, director of marketing, Jessica Stockel, and see if she can get um, the presentation to the attendees for today. Yeah, that would be helpful. And I would think for people that missed the meeting too. Sure. Uh, we are also recording yeah. this. So, um, you know, anyone can go back and skip to any section that they'd like to, to get a little bit more information on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Eric, the, the whole thing, uh, uh, as an example, I'm, I've had to present to the, the homeowners and the budget comparison report I find, and maybe this is just germane to us, I don't know, but you, know, you show income operating and income reserve in the same report, but then as you noted, there's no budget for the income reserve, which makes it look very awkward. We're favorable in income because there is no budget there. And then we're unfavorable in mm -hmm. reserve expenses because there's no budget there. So I don't get why we don't do a budget because it would look a whole lot cleaner and we wouldn't really have to explain anything given there would be numbers in there. If that, and, and again, we could take this offline with our specific situation, but. I find it awkward um, when you're trying to explain that to to our homeowners. Yeah, I do understand that, and it is okay. You know, it does appear on your budget comparison report as a large negative variance, depending on what you spent in your reserve right. expenses for that year. It's a good tracking tool to know exactly what you've spent. But I guess the reserve. Oh, budget, sure. If, oh, yeah. if you want to do a reserve budget, it's basically you know looking at the reserve study and what's coming up for right. repair replacement right. that year and the numbers attached to it, it is yeah. kind of a budget, but it's just, it's a, it's a constantly moving target because you never know <laughs> exactly what's going to happen a, a year's a long time um, to the elements in the association in that year. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we've just found with, with the, the board's understanding um, and, and talking about it, you know, presenting the financials to the owners in every board meeting throughout the course of a year that, that people understand why that looks the way it does. But I'm sure your manager could discuss it more with you, Dave. Sure. Sounds good.
Any other questions? All right. I don't think so. No, well, Mindy, appreciate it. Mindy, thank you for doing this with me today. Eric, thank you <laughs> for having me. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and stop recording and um, we'll talk to Jessica about getting the link out to access this training um, via our, our learning hub uh, and getting the slides to everybody. So thank you very much and enjoy your afternoon and weekend. Absolutely, thank you everyone. You too, you guys. Thanks. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>